Hello and welcome to Inside Out, the podcast for outdoor lovers. In recent months that's meant days out, but with the situation changing to allow overnight trips, we look at where to stay. Inside Out is brought to you by Countryside Mobility, an award-winning scheme from disability charity Living Options. So in light of that, we speak to the National Tourist Board to find out how it hopes to make the UK Europe's most accessible destination. And we speak to two pioneers, Ho Grange, a self-catering business in the Peak District, and Bespoke Hotels, who are looking to combine luxury and access in their boutique hotels. Along the way, we get some fresh air at one of Devon's most popular outdoor attractions, Horden Forest. And we get the inside story from the man that sends fear into the hearts of all accommodation, the hotel inspector. So pack your bags and join me for a bumper episode of Inside Out. Now, I thought we should start this episode by going straight to the top. Visit England is the organisation responsible for promoting and developing tourism in England, and I recently had the chance to speak to Ross Calladine, Head of Business Support. I started by asking him why improving access was such an important issue. Uh, One in five of the UK population meets the official definition of being disabled, but actually the group we're talking about here goes far, far beyond that. It's a very wide group. We're talking about people with a wide range of accessibility requirements, many of them hidden. Um, And you just have to think of people with hearing loss, visual impairment, uh, families with kids with autism, Mm. uh, maybe a family member with dementia, a really wide group that we're talking about here. And I know it's something that's really important to you, to you personally. I mean, I, I always think that, you know, you're a real champion. I just wondered, A, why it's, it's so important for you individually and also what kind of things that you've done over the years to try to, to make things better. Whilst I myself don't have any uh, personal accessibility requirements, I do have family uh, members and mm. close friends that have accessibility requirements. And it's when you travel with those friends and family members that you realize how difficult it can be. Mm. First and foremost, to plan the holiday and actually find the level of information that you require so that you can choose accommodation that's going to meet the needs of all of your party. And then actually when you arrive, does it all go to plan? So that's a real big driver for me, keeping them in my mind. Yeah, it's the same for me as well, having family members um, who are in that situation. And uh, I guess you, you reflected there on some of the things that can go wrong. But I've also, I mean, I'm sure you as well, have seen how much of a difference it makes when things go well, um, how, how appreciated it is, uh, not just by the person who may have an access need, but also by the, the whole group, the family, friends, whoever. Very much so. And a key message to the businesses is that if you attract the disabled person and their spend, you attract the spend of their entire party. I would say it's just the right thing to do. Um, And think of that close family friend that you have that has an access requirement and what it would be like not to take holidays together due to a lack of accessibility. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I guess one of the things I'm curious about is that obviously working for a national organisation, you get the chance to see how things are progressing. I think you've been involved in previous years with judging the accessibility category of the um, the tourism awards. So I just wondered from your perspective, how do you feel things are progressing across the country in terms of uh, tourism businesses and the opportunities that are available for people who who would like to to be able to go on holiday or have a day out. Yes, it's actually one part of my role which I, I particularly enjoy, and that really restores uh, your confidence and faith in the industry because we are increasingly seeing year on year more and more excellent examples. Um, so I think we're in an improving situation. But of course, it can never come quick enough. That, that's, that's encouraging to hear. I guess one of the things that people's perceptions often leads them to think, well, uh, accessible accommodation, maybe you think of something that, that's a separate type of accommodation, very specialist and maybe a bit clinical. But do you think that's changing? That is one area where we're seeing the most change. 
Um, and it is uh, now a misconception, actually, that accessible accommodation needs to look clinical and like a ho- um, like hospital accommodation. Mm. Um, I can name a few great examples in this space. There is a self-catering uh, cottage called um, The Dairy, and it's based at uh, the cottage in The Dales. And they've done it in a way that allows them to have a five-star quality rating and to have the flexibility um, for guests that need grab rails and more visual support elements to be able to take them away for people that don't need them. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I think that that's the ideal scenario because I, I guess from a business perspective, they're, they're wanting something that they can let out to a whole range of different people. You often also have groups that include uh, a mixture of people, some who have access to these, others that don't. So the more flexible that accommodation can be, the more appealing it is. That's that's great for everyone, isn't it? Yes, and what we're talking about here is a principle called universal design. So universal design, when you say it, makes uh, a lot of sense. It, it is when you are planning a space, a building, that you really look to design it in a way that can accommodate people with the r- widest range of needs. That's great. I, I think one of the frustrations I often have, have is you hear uh, businesses claiming, oh, we're, we're fully accessible. I'm never quite sure what they mean by that. I suspect it generally means that, that they're accessible um, for, for wheelchair users. But it's really thinking, as you said at the start, a, a much wider range of, of access needs and, and how you can provide a great experience for them. Yes, I think statements such as that, we are fully accessible, they are generally very well intended. However, um, that isn't always backed up because the detail is important for many people with access requirements. They need to know detailed things as to whether there are steps, for example, um, whether there are handrails. So we ask businesses to produce something called an accessibility guide. And it's really a detailed explanation of the venue's accessibility, including pictures. So it's very useful to the, uh, the visitor. From a a person who's maybe looking to go away and looking to have access to that kind of information, is there anywhere that you would suggest that they kind of look to to find the best examples of this? There are some really good websites nowadays. Um, There is a website called Ewan's Guide, which is a bit like uh, the TripAdvisor for accessibility. Uh, Definitely uh, worth a look. Um, And there are good links um, to where you can find information on accessible places to stay on Visit England's website. There's there's an array of different awards in the field. There's our own uh, Accessible and Inclusive Tourism Award, which is part of the Visit England Awards for Excellence. There are the Blue Badge Access Awards. Uh, The Katie's have an accessibility category. Um, And slightly different, from a a standards perspective, there is a scheme called the National Accessible Scheme, and that has a number of accommodation businesses that have been rated for their level of accessibility. So that's worth looking out for as well. Yeah, so that's a really good thing to to look out for. I guess to to finish off, really, I think you you have a group, don't you? You meet uh, together with other leading advocates for accessible tourism, and you're often looking to the future and how we can shape it to make it more accessible. What do you think, as a member of that group, the future holds in terms of tourism becoming more accessible? Yes, Visit England convenes England's Inclusive Tourism Action Group, which is a group of around 20 leading stakeholders who are all united in the mission to make England the most accessible tourism destination in Europe by by 2025. Um, So that's what I hope the future holds, uh, meeting that ambition that lofty ambition. Um, But to do that, we need to make accessibility part of the conversation naturally, uh, not for it to be an an add-on. And we need more and more businesses to embed it in uh, and for it to be second nature in all the world, what they do. Now, when we think about where to stay, we're often after some help. A recommendation or assurance. These days, the first point of call is online review sites like TripAdvisor, but traditionally, we'd be calling on the services of a somewhat mythical figure, the hotel inspector. For most of us, our impression is formed by maybe Alex Polizzi's TV series, or maybe those who are fans of 1970s TV, an episode of 40 Towers. But how close to the reality are these 
Well, I'm very pleased to be joined again by David Falk, who appeared in episode two of this uh, podcast. Um, and you work as a, a green access officer now, David. But in the past, and when I first met you, you were actually a hotel inspector, weren't you? <laughs> I was a hotel inspector yeah, many years ago, back uh, between 1996 and 2000. How did that come about? How, how do you end up becoming a hotel inspector? How, was it something you always wanted to do or did you stumble into it? Um, stumbled. Um, I, I never <laughs> thought of it as a job uh, ever. I, I was working in the hotel industry. That's my first career. And I used to work with a lady who then uh, moved on herself and, and became the uh, trainer of all the hotel inspectors for the tourist board. And I remember saying to her, I work in hotels. I want to become a hotel manager. And she said, no, go for this job. It'll be a hotel inspector. It'll be really fun. So I went for it. I got it. And never looked back, really. It was fantastic. A really, really good opportunity and a really fun job to do. So what what are the qualifications they look for? Is it is it primarily experience of working in, in, ho- in the hotel sector? Yes. The, what you're doing is you're, you're assessing the quality of where you stay, but you're also giving a lot of feedback to the owner. And if you're, do, if you're going to do that, you need some empathy and understanding of how the industry works. So all the hotel assessors were people from the industry. They'd worked in the hospitality industry It was good that you could reflect on your own experience and understanding and understand why maybe things didn't always go as smoothly as they wanted them to go because, you know, the chef had had a night off and sous chef was stepping in and that kind of thing. And you can understand the issue. That's starting to make me think of an episode of 40 Towers (laughs) with the Americans, but but never mind. (laughs) I think I think I did stay in a 40 Towers residence once, actually. Um, uh, I won't say where it was, but it very, very (laughs) much reminded me of it. And I'm I'm pretty sure the manager was basing himself on Basil 40. It was really quite comical. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, yes, it's helpful to to know that you, you do much more than just give out a, a few stars. But um, I think one of the things that we probably also think is a, a key qualification is is the being a master of disguise, because you have to be incognito in many occasions. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you go about that? Yes, you, you, you were supposed to be incognito. So what would happen? You would stay overnight in a hotel or a and b and you weren't supposed to say who you were until the morning when you departed. And after checkout, you would then present your business card and say, hello, I am actually David Falk, your hotel inspector, and this is where I've been staying. But very often, people would kind of twig who you were. So certainly the B&Bs would sometimes twig it. And Was it the notebook? Funny... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, it, 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 sometimes it was the fact that you, you'd gone to a B and B in the middle of nowhere, and you've turned up in in a suit with a tie, because you've been visiting businesses in the daytime, and they'd look at you and say, "Oh, what are you doing here?" And you'd have to come up with some story. And my my stock story was that I was just in the area doing some survey, and I remember one B and B owner got really interested in it and she said oh what kind of survey and are you doing and it was because her son had gone off to university to study land surveying and I had to dig this sort of rabbit hole of a, of a story as to what I was up to and in the end managed to change the conversation to something completely different and escape but um but it was it was very good fun oh, I, I do remember myself being in a similar situation to you because um when I worked at the same tourist board the east of England um they, they were very good at trying to give you experience of what other people in the organisation were doing. And they, they gave me the opportunity to go out with one of the hotel inspectors, Andrew, one of your colleagues. And um, yes, yes. for whatever reason, we, we decided that it would be sensible for me to accompany him on a trip to North Norfolk in January at this B&B. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> I was paranoid for the entire time that I was going to give the, you know, let the cat out the bag. And um, the only thing we had in common was, was working for the tourist board. But that was the one thing, of course, we couldn't talk about at breakfast. So <laughs> it was a very stilted conversation. So I, I did have a little bit of an idea of how difficult it can be sometimes. But I guess my next question is really, you know, obviously you check in and then you've got the evening. What what do you do in the evening? What, I mean, you're just stuck in the bedroom or are you doing what they do on well, four in a bed, pulling up the mattresses? And... <laughs> I find that program quite painful to watch, actually. Because <laughs> they're quite picky and quite they get quite personal on quite, it. But, no, very, what you would do is, yeah, very, yeah. Um, what you would do, you would, you would have a score sheet and you would go through uh, all the elements of your accommodation and, and give it a score rating. Um, so you would look at you would look at the bed, you would look at the, the, the cleanliness of the room, you'd look at all the bathroom accessories, uh, you'd look at the accessories in the room, the tea tray and so forth. And some of the work in the evening was actually just doing the score sheet and the score sheet would give you the rating and then have a whole day of site visits and, and 
visit another hotels during the day before arriving at another hotel or B&B for the evening, finishing up all those reports um, and then and then doing the assessments and the feedback and everything else. So it was a very full day. I, you practically were working from the minute you woke up to the minute you went to bed. Um, Talk, but yeah, Talking of being full, David, I, I'm guessing you're having to test the breakfast. Did you ever get sick yes. of having a <laughs> full English breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, a little bit, but I, I do remember um, staying. I had a five-star hotel in my patch, which was quite good. I mean, in in a lot of rural areas, you don't have a lot of five-star hotels. You yeah. have some very nice hotels, but not necessarily for five-star. And I did have a five-star in Hertfordshire. It was, and um, I remember when I arrived there, I had to get there quite early because I had to sample afternoon tea. I then also had to sample <laughs> dinner in the restaurant. And I also had to sample room <laughs> service, which I had very late at night. And then in the morning, I had to come down. I actually had room service breakfast uh, of a, a glass of juice, I think it was, and something quite light, before coming down later and having full breakfast in the restaurant. Um, so by the time I checked out, I was even quite full. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just imagine that you went on from there to another another business who were desperate to, to treat you to their their refreshments. <laughs> Well, that was the thing during the daytime. Everywhere you went, everyone would immediately say, would you like a cup of tea? And of course, you don't yeah. want to be rude and say no. So you'd say yes. But by three in the afternoon, you were so full of food and tea, you just couldn't move. But, um, <laughs> but I can so now understand sort of... why you've moved on to being green access officer, because you need to work <laughs> off all these calories over the years. <laughs> but, you know, it's taken 10 years of walking to wear it all off, Neil. So... <laughs> 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 yes, I can I can understand that. I, I guess you must have um, come across some some funny. I mean, you've already shared a few funny stories. Are there, are there any others that come to mind in terms of people's reactions when you uh, you told them who you were or things that happened along the way? There, there were moments I mentioned about you know being um, people spotting who I was and asking questions and asking what type of surveyor I was. That happened. <laughs> that five star hotel I mentioned. I used to stay in the five star hotel. Um, when it was my birthday, and I think they twigged that qu pretty quickly. It was early February one year. It was my birthday, and I'd stayed there, and they did valet parking. And when I came down in the morning to check out, I hadn't announced who I was, but I think they twigged who I was. My car had been brought round to the front without me even asking, and the wow. engine was running to warm the car up. And they had <laughs> it was a frosty morning. They'd gone round the whole car and defrosted all the windows. They'd cleaned my car and valeted it. And on the front, this is the days before sat nav, mm -hmm. on, the, on the passenger seat, they'd laid out my atlas so I could navigate my way away from the hotel oh. that day. And I thought, I thought, wow. this, this service is exceptional. And then I thought, mm, I think you know who I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess one of the final questions I have was really people listening to this and, and maybe thinking now that uh, there are opportunities to stay overnight. Have you got any ideas for them in terms of tips for how they can decide where to stay? I mean, many people look at uh, TripAdvisor or equivalent sites these days, but uh, I just wondered if you had any advice for people when they're choosing where to stay. Do you know, the industry's moved so far from when I was a hotel inspector. Back in the late 90s, there was no TripAdvisor, there was no Booking.com. So people were more reliant back then on Tourist Board or AA or RAC ratings for accommodation mm. now. There's a whole plethora of, of uh, ways you can find out where to stay. And I personally, I, I don't, this will sound terrible in a way, but I don't <laughs> go to the hotel ratings um, when I choose somewhere to stay. I will go and look at people's photos and their uh, recommendations. So I tend to research across a, a, platf a range of different platforms. I tend to look at different websites. I look at the own the own website for the business and then make decisions based on all, all of that of where to stay. Well, that's been really interesting, David. I, we, I think we could probably fill a whole podcast with just this conversation. <laughs> but I guess my final question is, and I'm slightly nervous about asking this because you have come to stay with me, but uh, do you find it difficult to switch off? Are you once a, a hotel inspector, always a hotel inspector? <laughs> I switch off. Don't worry, Neil. I do switch off. <laughs> no, I think there is an element. I say that. There is an element of once an inspector, always an inspector. I, I'm always always fascinated by um, customer care and standards in hotels and restaurants where I go and stay. I always have this urge to go and call or speak to the manager and say, look, that didn't go well and that's why. And you could be so much better if only you did more for your customers. 
I went to a place recently and asked for a cup of coffee, but I wanted a particular coffee in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And they refused to make it. They said, you can have a cappuccino latte and that's it. And I I said, well, what I really wanted was an espresso. It was a little bit of hot hot milk on top. I didn't want a big cup. And they said, nope. And they they refused to serve me what I wanted. So I never never go back. And that's what other people will do. They'll never go back. So there is an element, as you said, once an inspector, always an Mm. inspector. Well, thank you very much for giving us that insight, David. I will be uh, making sure your espresso is is perfect when you next come to visit. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Neil. I'll be expecting thank- it now. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. It'll be lined up ready for you. Thank you very much for your, ta- <laughs> for your time thank and you. uh, for giving that, us, us that insight. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Well, when I was preparing for this episode, one place to stay that immediately came to mind was Ho Grange a holiday home and glamping business in the Peak District, uh, which is a double winner in the Access category of the National Tourism Awards. And I'm delighted to be joined by David now from Hogrange so we can find out a bit more. Thank you for for joining us, David. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to being able to help. Well, uh, do you want to start off by, I mean, I mentioned the Peak District there, but do you want to give us a a, a bit more of an idea of your setting? Because it is beautiful. Oh, yes, we are in a stunning part of the Derbyshire Peak District. Uh, We're on a working farm. Uh, the nearest property is over half a mile away. We've got uninterrupted views of the hills and grassland. Um, and on a day like today, with the sun shining, I don't think there's a better place on this earth. Lovely. I, th- I think I'm already wishing I was there. Uh, and you, you have a range of different accommodation, don't you? We, we do. We have four larger log cabin lodge type accommodation, three of which are fully accessible with wet rooms. We have uh, a fourth one, which is a level access larger three bedroom lodge then we've got two glamping pods and we have a vintage gypsy caravan as well wow it's quite a selection there uh, and, and great to have something for everyone really i mean one thing you particularly have specialized in is, is accessible holidays I, I wonder what led you to to focus on on that market in particular um it was a little bit of a happy accident uh, when we were doing the business plan for developing the business before we opened it became quite apparent that the nationwide back in 2005 when we were doing this that there was only around about a thousand uh, holiday cottages that were registered registered for disabled access so we thought Mm. that it was quite a market to go into with no experience in it so it did take uh, a lot of research but uh, it turned out to be one of the best moves we've ever made. Uh, and in terms of the measures you've put in place to, to make uh, your accommodation accessible, do you want to just give a, a kind of range of the different sorts of things you've done? Yeah, well, because we were building lodges from scratch, we were able to design the buildings with wheelchair access and ease of use in mind there. So we put in wet rooms, we put in wider doorways, level access or gentle ramped access, large spaces for turning in the rooms so that the, particularly the wheelchair accessible three we have we we sacrificed a whole bedroom but didn't reduce the size of the building so we we've got much more space for turning in the bedrooms and for the wet room so um and we added things like a uh, clothes mat wash dry toilet um, and we've got mobile hoists and we've got shower chairs a selection of and we've got a whole raft of equipment that helps everybody uh, make the most of their holiday Fantastic. And you also have things for um, for guests with visual or hearing impairments? We do, yes. We have, uh, we're, we're registered for level one visual and level one hearing. So that means things like the door frames are visual, the door frames are a, a contrasting colour. We have actually have braille um, notices on the taps and on the cooker and on the main um, instruction, uh, main controls. Um, we have increased lighting levels, and then on for the for the uh, hard of hearing, we have visual and mm-hmm. vibrating alarms that connect to the fire exit, uh, portable hearing loops. We have games for the visually hard, visually impaired and the hearing impaired as well. That's a, a really comprehensive. You've obviously given it an awful lot of thought. Um, I guess one of the, the things that often comes to mind is, you know, is is that at the expense of of uh, style and quality and so on? Or how have you, you managed to blend those two things together? Well, we, we, we were determined not to compromise on style and quality when we um, 
first started and, and through all our developments. But we have actually re just redone one. Uh, the first one we did originally was a little bit clinical. So we've completely refitted that last year and we've now got designer uh, accessible furniture. So it looks beautiful. The other thing that we've done in, in that we've specifically designed our kitchens ourselves for uh, we have one kitchen that has a cupboard that's on wheels under the sink. So when you go in normally, you see, as you would see in any normal kitchen, a, a row of cupboards all the way around. But you, you, you get hold of the cupboard handle and pull it, and the whole thing slides out on wheels and reveals a, a knee hole under the sink for wheelchair access. And then that thing that wheels out also then doubles up as a lower work surface for anybody in a wheelchair to have easier access to equipment. Great. I mean, I, I'm guessing that the obvious thing is that it benefits the person who may have an access needs, but I presume it really transforms the holiday for the whole group. What difference do you, do you find it makes for the guests that you have who are making use of these facilities and services? I think the, the main thing it does for them is it makes them feel as if they're part of the family and they're part of a family holiday. And we've done other things such as uh, we've got off-road wheelchairs that will climb the hills of the Peak District, electric powered. And it means that everybody can go out in one group. But as the family go out for a walk, the person in the wheelchair no longer has to sit behind and watch them go. They all go as mm. part of one family. So that's that's our that's our ethos really is to make it, it it somebody may be in a wheelchair, but they are our guest and they deserve every bit of luxury and comfort that anybody else would expect. And I think the other thing that is a real advantage is that there's been an awful lot of work in Derbyshire to to make it more accessible. There's a group Accessible Derbyshire that I think you're closely connected with. So there's a really good range of um, other attractions and things to do locally, aren't there? There are, yes. We're very lucky. Um, the work that Accessible Derbyshire have done has been amazing. They've got a lot of the attractions on board, make sure that they're providing the right sort of access, the right sort of toilets more people have come on board and everybody that we talk to now is is looking to be more inclusive well thank you again to david and if you're tempted to stay and why wouldn't you be then i've got good news for you ho grange now offers a full money back guarantee on all bookings for cancellations up to three days before arrival for any reason so you can book ahead with confidence we'll put a link in the uh, description so have a look there take a look at their website and do consider going to visit them it's a beautiful location now, on a hot summer's day, what could be better than a forest walk? One of the first locations to work with Countryside Mobility all of 10 years ago was Halden Forest, and it's proved a great success ever since. I'm very pleased to say that I'm joined by Katie Harrison from, uh, well, I always wonder, is it Halden or Howden? Have I got Hold it right or wrong? Holden. <laughs> Holden, yeah. It is Go Holden. Holden. Do you want to start off by just giving us an idea of the location for those who aren't familiar with um, Holden Forest? Whereabouts is it? Yeah, it's it's really close to Exeter, actually. It's just about a 15-minute drive from Exeter, but it's close to the A38 and the A380, so it's really handy to get to from wherever you're coming from, really, in the southwest. But the great thing about it is, with, like, I guess with all forests, you wouldn't know that because once you're in the forest, in the trees, you know, it can absorb lots of people, um, you feel a long way from Exeter. It does give that solitude and, and shade as well. It really does. We've got quite a few habitats actually here. So it is, it's a really lovely mix of kind of woodland and heathland. And, and you're right, once you kind of leave the car park, you can, you know, be surrounded by people. And then all of a sudden, two minutes later, you're kind of, you're on your own and you're hearing the birds and it is lovely. And people go there for different experiences. You've got a, a range of different facilities. Do you want to give us an idea of the range of, of activities that people can do there? Yeah, we've got we've got something for everyone. We really have. We've got walking trails, cycling trails, running trails, even Nordic walking kind of routes, um, orienteering courses. Um, for our visitors who look for something a bit more adventurous, we have Go Ape and Go Segway, and they offer a completely different experience. You know, you get to see the forest from the trees or or gliding through on, on, a, on a Segway. Yeah, I always mean to come up and have a go on the Segway. I'm not sure I'd be gliding. I think <laughs> uh, Maybe after, <laughs> after a while I would be, but uh, it always appeals and I must get round to it sometime. Have you had a go, Katie? I have had a go. It's one of those things, if you think about it, you know, it, it kind of, it doesn't go so well, but if it, you just kind of go with the flow and go with it, it, yeah, it's intuitive. It is really good. It's definitely worth a try. I mean, what is the main of the appeal of the forest for yourself? What, what do you love about the forest? What do you think people come time and again? 
Uh, I think people come to get away from from kind of the hustle and bustle of everyday life. And I think that's why the forest is wonderful, because, you know, being in nature it is so good for your kind of your, your well-being. Um, and I think people really need that, especially at the moment. Um, for me, Holden, I mean, the viewpoints are just spectacular. You know, it kind of always takes your breath away, no matter how often you see it, when you go out onto our main viewpoint. And, you you know, you can look to the Holden Belvedere Tower all over Exeter, right the way down to the excestry. I mean, you know, on a clear day, that is absolutely stunning. And then even from our bird of prey viewpoint where you've got the, the kind of the views over the Teen Valley, um, you, you just can't beat them really. I mean, it's lovely. Yeah, I, it just offers a real nice variety for a lot of different people. And I think it's wonderful. Yeah, and I, have you got any tips in terms of when people could maybe go there if they're looking for a, a particularly tranquil experience when maybe there's, there's more nature around? Yeah, I mean, our car park is open from seven o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night. So, you know, we really do kind of encourage people to come at those different times. And, um, you know, obviously you do see more wildlife kind of <laughs> at the beginning and the start of the day when mm. there are a lot less people around. But like I say, even if you did come, you know, at our kind of busier times, if, if you're happy to go off into kind of, you know, further into the forest, you will find actually that you're probably on your own or with very few people for the rest of your visit. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I remember my most special memory of uh, Holden was a walk I did, I think it must have been about eight o'clock in the morning there one one, uh, one day and I saw deer and all sorts of wildlife. And yeah, it was a magical experience. So I really highly recommend that. Um, Katie, uh, obviously one of the reasons we're speaking to you is because you have some of our trampers there. Uh, what experience do they offer and what difference do they make for the people who use them? Oh, our visitors love the trampers here at Holden. I mean, you know, like you said earlier, you know, we've we've had trampers here for te about 10 years now um, and they've always been so popular. You know, they give people their freedom back to kind of go out into the forest, you know, whereas before they might have been visiting and they were stuck to kind of waiting in the car or waiting, you know, in a picnic yeah. bench near the cafe, you know, for their kind of families to kind of go off on their walks and come back. And having the trampers mean that they can either join their families or, you know, we've got lots of kind of wildlife enthusiasts that, that can now go back out into the forest and, and do what they used to do, um, but obviously on a tramper and, and it just gives that freedom back. Um, we're really lucky now that we've got three trampers, which is quite a unique offer. And I think that's one of the great things about Holden is, is that ability for a whole group to be able to experience it together, whatever uh, you know access needs they may have, people can, can go out together and that, that's a really special thing. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I love the bird song in the background, Katie. It's, <laughs> it's sounding magical out there, there at the moment. I wish I was. <laughs> I wish oh, I was there. Yeah, I mean, birds are something. We've got a lot of birds here. You know, even even in the busy times, if you're in the kind of the main recreation hub, you know, we've got a bird feeding station, and the amount of birds that you will see, even you know, in the middle of the day when there's so many people around, it really is quite special. One final thing. I think you've named your trampers, haven't you? Yes, that's put me on the spot. We've got hiking Hilda, <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe Gertrude. I can't actually remember off the top of my head, but yes, we've named them Freeze because we've got so many. <laughs> we need to keep a track of which ones are going out or which ones need, you know, maybe a bit more air in the tires or something. So yeah, we have named them and they have got little name stickers on. So um, it, yeah, it's a bit of fun, but also is quite useful, um, you know, for us to kind of keep track of them all. <laughs> Yeah, which ones are on which. Great. Well, thank you. I hope lots of people come to you now that lockdown is easing, in, easing a bit, then it's a great place to visit. So thank you very much, Katie. And uh, we look forward to our next visit to you whenever that may be. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Neil. Now, when I was preparing for this episode and thinking about good examples of accessible accommodation, it was often self-catering that came to mind. Now, one person looking to set an example within the hotel sector is Robin Shepherd, chairman of the Bespoke Hotels Group. Thank you very much for joining us, Robin. Could you maybe start by telling us a little bit about Bespoke Hotels and, and what's distinctive about your hotel group? Uh, Bespoke Hotels is a 20-year-old management company with uh, approximately 70 hotels across the UK from Cornwall to Caithness. The properties are individual and quirky. Uh, we don't homogenize. We like to make sure the hotels have local hero status. Mm. And uh, I um, oversaw a, a, a development in our company where we've become a lot more 
disability and accessibility conscious uh, for several reasons, not least my own illness, which uh, took place about 12 years ago when I fell ill with a, a, a nasty paralyzing illness called Guillain-Barré syndrome. So I spent several years in a wheelchair and became acutely aware of how poor hotels were at anticipating the needs of their disabled guest. So that was the germination and everything sort of spread from there. Fantastic. And I understand you've been working with a, a company called uh, Motion Spot. Um, what's, the, what's the idea behind that and, and, and what difference is it making? Well, once I started to research how reactively poor and proactively silent hotels were, uh, I set up um, a structure called the Blue Badge Access Awards designed to encourage people to enter a competition for design excellence um, which has grown from purely being a design-led uh, inspiration in cooperation with Reba and the Design Council into a much more pan exercise where we've combined with um, uh, prizes for uh, design uh, as architects, design as interiors, design from a technological point of view, but also good behavior and uh, signs of initiatives which hoteliers are taking to improve the way in which they behave. Um, this is uh, launched in 2016, and the, the winners of the very first year by a country mile were Motion Spot, who just blew me away with the quality of their entry, their intellect, and their vision. Um, and a friendship has grown out of that uh, prize giving uh, start, and we've become uh, very close to them. And we've used Motion Spot on a number of projects that we've been new building and refurbishing ever since. And and what does that look like in practical terms within the hotel design of a bedroom, for example, or a bathroom? What different uh, measures are being put in place? Well, first of all, there's the aesthetic. We want our accessible rooms to feel as though uh, anybody can use them, whether they're able-bodied or uh, or not. Um, so the grab handles, the, the industrial hospital-looking parts of the um, bathroom and uh, access and entry to the bedroom have all been softened so that whilst they're compliant, they also just feel normal. Mm -hmm. um, and there's often an accusation that staying in a, a disabled room in a, a conventional hotel just feels like a trip to uh, an institution or, or to a hospital. So that's the first thing. The physical measures and the sentiment that sit behind us, behind all of that, uh, can be seen in uh, projects ranging from Dorking to Manchester where we've used some of their vision and their skills and their product specification to weave into those rooms. And we've now reimagined the rooms by christening them Liberty Rooms. We feel that's a little bit more of an empowering title. Mm. We feel it uh, positions this not as a compensation, but as an expression of, of happiness. And we want those rooms to feel as though they uh, deliver all the facilities that uh, someone with compromise in their life might need. But at the same time, is exciting and doesn't relegate or marginalise them. That, that aspect is so important, but you mentioned the hotel design, but also that guest experience is equally important. Uh, and what kind of feedback have you had from guests who've used those rooms? How does it differ to their typical experience? Well, the, the, the extraordinary thing is how many able-bodied people have specified those rooms uh, mm. over and above uh, conventional uh, disabled rooms, uh, sorry, just conventional bedrooms, um, because they feel there's a little bit more space, uh, the desk size is more generous, and they, they, they appreciate the, the flow of, of, of the rooms. For the disabled customer, uh, we've had extraordinary feedback in terms of thank you. Thank you for just giving us a little bit of dignity and focus, uh, uh, because compa compounding the, the physical investment into the, into the real estate is a training program and a disability confidence program to try and make our staff feel much more comfortable around people who have issues and, and more sympathetic to them in terms of uh, opening dialogue and making that person feel uh, welcome and thought about. Well, I think one of the biggest issues that uh, many of your listeners will experience is that when you get to a hotel, there's a level of uncertainty, and it is that uncertainty which makes you antisocial. You're not sure if you're going to be able to get your wheelchair in over the lip at the front entrance. You, you don't know if there will be a lip at the front entrance. Uh, you're not sure how easy it is to get to the loo on the public floors. All those sort of basic primary questions which 
we're doing our best to try and answer to give people uh, consolation and comfort before they arrive. The most recent example of this has been in Manchester. We developed a new hotel, which is very cool and very funky, called Hotel Brooklyn on Portland Street in Manchester. It's got 191 bedrooms, but of those, 18 of them are ambulant or uh, uh, disabled uh, accessible. Mm. Um, and they include suites. And I, I've, I've never found a hotel before that offered a disability or an accessibility suite. It just It's unicorn uh, territory, really, in terms of rarity. Mm. Um, and the reaction we've had to that has just been extraordinary. So it's lots and lots of touches like that. Mm. And I, I just felt that if we could come up with one hotel in Britain as an exemplar of good practice, uh, why not do it ourselves and give the opportunity for others to follow? That's brilliant. I mean, and as you say, it's that combination, isn't it, of the, of the physical measures that are taken, but also the staff having that confidence and providing the information about it so people know about it. So um, that, that's great to have that example, um, and I hope many others will follow you. You, you talked earlier on that, that, that you feel that there aren't that many at the moment in the hotel sector who are looking at this. I, I wonder what, why do you feel that is, and, and what do you think needs to be done to encourage more hotels to move forward? I mean, the showcase case you've created is great, but what other things need to be done? Well, I think it's influencing the leaders and the followers will follow. Um, so my um, area of uh, sort of drive, if you like, has been to persuade some of my peers and colleagues in the industry that they should take the lead and elect uh, access champions in their business. Um, I had a, a occasion at a, an awards ceremony at Gravener House last November to be able to speak to about a thousand of my industry colleagues. And I threw down a challenge. I said, could you please go back into your business tomorrow and appoint an industry champion for access? Um, and bless them, the very first hotel was Glen Eagles in Scotland, who rang at nine o'clock the following day to say they just appointed their first one. So yeah. the message is getting out there. So um, uh, if we looked at the Royal Lancaster Hotel in London, they've recently won great applause for the work that they've been doing on their disability uh, features. Uh, if you look in... Um, Leicester Square. It's a new hotel being built by the Edwardian Group called the Londoner, and their mandate to the interior designer is we want the best in class uh, accessible features that we can possibly put into our bedstock. So I have high hopes that it will become the new normal. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much for taking the time. I know this, this is a challenging time for the hospitality sector. And hopefully, as lockdown eases, things will improve and we really wish you every success in terms of your drive to achieve more accessibility in the hotel sector. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this bumper edition of Inside Out and it's given you some inspiration for places to stay and visit. Do take a look at any of the links that will be in the description with this podcast and let us know your recommendations. You'll find us on social media at CM Southwest on Twitter and at Countryside Mobility on Facebook. I'm pleased to say we're starting to see a number of locations where we offer all-terrain mobility scooters for hire. They're starting to reopen, so do keep an eye on our social media for that and also on our website, countrysidemobility.org. That's all for now, but thank you for listening. Spread the word and join us again next time. Until then, stay safe and keep well. Thank you.